Welcome back, chemistry students, to the second video on covalent bonding. And in this part, we're going to give you some more detail, expand on what we learned in the last slide, or the last segment. Okay, so when we're bonding our two elements together and they're sharing electrons, we need to make sure that our octet rule is being followed. So we need to make sure that each of our bonded elements uh, has a full outer valence shell of electrons. Uh, most cases, that'll be eight. Um, when I do bond two atoms together and they share one single pair of electrons, they're going to form what's called a single covalent bond. So again, they're going to be sharing one pair, two electrons between the two, much like um, our hydrogen here. Uh, we have two hydrogen atoms together. Each of them has one valence electron. So when we covalently bond them, they're going to form a single covalent bond in which they share one pair of electrons. You can see that here in this model as well. I think it's important that we emphasize that it's sharing pairs of electrons. You can't just say sharing an electron because that makes it sound like it's just one, but there's, it's always a pair of electrons that is shared. Right. Being, being shared between two atoms. Right. So the sigma bond is formed when two atomic orbitals overlap to form a, a new molecular orbital that actually holds the molecule together. That sigma bond is just a chemistry word for a single bond. Sigma bonds are single bonds. And the sigma bond is on the bond axis, which is the imaginary line that connects the two bonded nuclei together. So if you look down here at the bottom of the slide, you have, um, in hydrogen, you have two S orbitals. The one S orbital from one hydrogen is going to overlap with the one S orbital from the other hydrogen and make a sigma bond, a molecular orbital that holds the two nuclei together. And the same thing can happen with two p orbitals that happen to be next to each other. Like in chlorine, where you have the, the lone unpaired electrons are in uh, 3p in chlorine. So you have two different p orbitals overlapping and merging with each other and making a sigma bond uh, and a new molecular orbital. And don't get too hung up on uh, the terms there, atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals. You know the atomic orbitals are the S, P, D, and F. Uh, molecular orbitals are, for our purposes here in Chem 1, are just you know where those electrons reside when they're being shared. We're not going to get into it in any more detail than that. But you will see that term molecular orbital thrown around here and there. We can use our Lewis dot structures, and we've been doing that in class a little bit now, uh, to not only visualize each of our individual atoms, but also the formation of that single covalent bond. Uh, so when we do this, we want to write out our valence electrons for each of our elements, find any unpaired electrons there are, and then pair them up so that they're sharing those unpaired electrons. And when you're doing this, just make sure that you're being flexible where you put your electron dots. And again, we got to practice, which is what we're going to be doing a lot in class. And eventually, you're going to replace those shared electron dots, so that pair of shared electrons, with a dash, and that's going to represent our bond. And again, we can't ignore any of those unshared pairs or those lone pairs on the central atom, and we'll get into that a little bit. Yeah, they become really important later when we're talking about the overall shape of the molecule and the polarity of that molecule, which is affected by its shape. Okay, so how do two atoms with more than one lone electron bond with each other? So looking at oxygen, we've got a model of oxygen somewhere around here. Oxygen has two uh, unshared pairs and then two lone electrons. And that's a perfect case where not just uh, one orbital from each atom can overlap, but actually two of them can overlap. And we're going to end up here with a double bond. You'll see our electron dot structure shows a lot of dots there in the middle, and it might look a little bit confusing. But when we change those shared pairs of electrons from dots to dashes to show that they really are being shared, uh, it's obvious that a double bond has formed there. We have just two atoms in this bond. The shape is going to be very simple. It's going to be a linear-shaped uh, molecule. But the bonding uh, between the two is just a little bit different than our initial sigma bond, although there's a sigma bond in there. Mm -hmm. And with nitrogen, did you guys start this lab with your class already? By the time yep. they see these notes? So they've actually worked with this. 
with nitrogen, you have three unpaired electrons on each nitrogen, and they're all looking for a partner. So all three of those unshared or unpaired electrons from each nitrogen are going to be offered up, and you're going to form three covalent bonds between two atoms. And we call that a triple bond, and you have those orbital overlaps, and it's, it's, it's actually a very strong bond. There's a lot more orbital overlap happening there. Um, there's, I guess, overlapping deeper. The nuclei get closer to each other than they do in a, with a single bond or even a double. Now, how there's a little bit more to this. There's these double and triple bonds are not just three, two or three sigma bonds happening. Um, there is a sigma bond that happens in the space directly between the two nuclei, but then there's something else going on. So here we're showing you two p orbitals. And uh, the two nuclei that are in the very center there, when those uh, come close enough to each other, and there can be that direct overlap of the sigma bond right way there in the middle, those p orbitals end up bumping into each other. They end up around the bond axis. They, it looks like they take up a lot of space, and they do, even though they're still just holding two valence electrons. But that's because there's not enough room directly in between the two nuclei. These kind of have to fill in the space around right. that. Well, I mean, there's already an electron pair right. in that space between the two nuclei, and all electrons, whether they're being shared happily or not, they're all uh, negatively charged, and those negatively charged particles just cannot be squeezed into that small of a space. So the, the second bond that's formed, uh, this pi bond, has to reach out around the existing sigma bond that's in there between the two nuclei. So that's having a one sigma bond and then one pi bond is how we get a double bond. Okay, and then there's another kind of bond called a coordinate covalent. It's a covalent bond, keep that in mind. Covalent means there's a shared pair of electrons. But the coordinate part, that comes into play where we look at where those shared electrons are coming from. Uh, there are some atoms, like our example of oxygen here, that have, say, two uh, electrons available. And I usually like to use the uh, ammonia to the ammonium polyatomic ion uh, model for that. But oxygen needs to be generous here. Carbon clearly is not going to have enough oxygen has to say, okay, I've got an unshared pair here, um, I could throw it into the mix and, and let this be a part of bonding also. And when oxygen does that, then carbon can reach its octet. You see a triple bond between the carbon and oxygen in carbon monoxide. So, some people might ask on that, on that very, very bottom diagram there, well, why doesn't carbon just throw its pair of electrons in? Why is it oxygen that gives them up? Well, if, if carbon throws its pair of electrons in and forms the coordinate covalent bond that way, then oxygen only has, or thinks it only has, six valence electrons. And oxygen's just trying to make sure everybody has eight. Right, and carbon, that wouldn't really help carbon because no. it still wouldn't have eight. Right. So, and it, it's the atom with the higher electronegativity yeah. is the one that tends to, to do this in the examples that you're going to see. Okay, there are some exceptions to the octet rule. All right. So we can't satisfy that eight valence electrons when we have a total number of valence electrons for our molecular compound. That's going to be odd. Or if the atom has fewer or more than eight valence electrons after bonding is complete. Uh, so they're very rare, and we've got a couple examples for you here, uh, which you can see right there. NO2, BF3, and also phosphorus uh, and five chlorines there. With, with NO2, if you count up the number of valence electrons that are available for sharing, there's, let's see, oxygen, six oxygen's oxygen. got six and nitrogen's got five, that's 11. So you have an odd number of electrons there. In BF3, boron only has three valence electrons. So... Fluorine has seven right. times three. But, um, it's still, it's not going to really work. Uh, boron is a rare element that is okay having six yeah. valence electrons instead of eight. And then there are things like with phosphorus, and you see this with sulfur also, that can actually have more than eight. Mm -hmm. So we keep talking about this octet rule, octet rule, octet rule is so important, but 
there's a lot of exceptions in chemistry, and there are a lot of other things that can happen uh, that you might not expect. Most of the compounds you're working with will satisfy the octet rule, but just kind of know that it's out there that uh, there are other situations that can arise. Thank you very much for watching this podcast. Make sure that you respond to your homework and ask us a question about anything that was not clear.